The Gospel of Jesus Christ contains the wonderful news about salvation through Christ, a new and better covenant, and the opportunity to be part of Jesus' kingdom. The message of the Gospel works by calling people to God, converting people from their sins, and saving people from their sins. But even though there is so much potential in the Gospel to do so many extraordinary things, what exactly does the Gospel require of you? Does it even require anything? Let's investigate how the Bible answers this question during the course of this Bible study. First, I want us to see that the gospel requires that we die with Christ. Does the gospel automatically save everyone? Certainly, God's salvation-bringing grace has appeared or has been made available to everyone, Titus 2 verse 11. However, Jesus was very clear in demonstrating that not everyone would be saved. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, he says that the majority of people will live their lives in a way that will result in everlasting punishment, while only a few will live in a way so as to be saved eternally. So by implication, there must be something required of us in order to be saved and access the blessings of God's grace and the gospel. The message of the gospel tells you that Jesus Christ willingly gave his life on the cross for you, so that you could be saved from the eternal consequences of your sins. However, he did not do so in order for you to continue living in your sins. Instead, the scriptures teach that Jesus Christ gave his life for you so that you would give your life to him. Thus, the scriptures discuss the importance of those who follow Christ who have been crucified with Christ. Notice the language of some passages with me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, it says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. In Galatians 2 and in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 11, It says, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Colossians 3 verse 3 says, for for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3 verse 5, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Romans 6 and verse 2 asks, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Romans 6 verse 8 says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now as you reflect on these passages, you should be impressed with the frequent usage of this language in the writings of the Apostle Paul as he was writing to those who were Christians. Clearly, God expects individuals to give their lives entirely to him, but that's not unique just to Paul's writings. Jesus Christ himself taught that there that those who desire to be his disciples must be entirely devoted to living for him, as you can see in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26, and Luke 14, verses 25 through 33. But how do we die with Christ and live for him? The answer to this is found through obeying the gospel's plan of salvation. That is, what God says you must do in order to be saved from your sins and have everlasting life in heaven. Before we consider what it is specifically God has commanded of you in order to be saved, please realize that God has required you to obey him. As we consider these passages, please recognize the fact that God requires more of you than just mentally accepting Jesus as the Christ and Savior. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus taught that there would be many people on the day of judgment who would profess to be followers of him. They will say, that they believed in him, and that they had done many wonderful works in his name. However, Jesus will sentence them to eternal punishment in hell because they had not been obedient to the will of God. Also, in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7-9, through 9, Paul states that those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ will be punished with everlasting destruction and experience the wrath of the Almighty God. Furthermore, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9 says that Jesus Christ became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. 
these passages are just a sample of how the gospel commands you to be obedient to its message. Yes, it does matter what you believe and practice in the name of religion and even in the name of Christianity. You must be contending earnestly for the faith of the gospel in the language of Philippians 1 verse 27 and Jude 1 verse 3. This involves holding fast to the pattern of sound words contained throughout the entire New Testament, 2 Timothy 1 verse 13. For, as we see in 2 John chapter 1 verses 9 through 11, it says that if you do not abide in the doctrine of Christ, that is all the teaching of the New Testament, you do not have God. Now, having established that the gospel requires you to give your life entirely to God and be obedient to his teaching throughout the New Testament, you need to consider what God requires you to do in order to be saved. Let's think about the gospel's plan of salvation as we try to answer the question, what does the gospel require? Although mankind answers the question, what must I do to be saved, in many different ways, let's consider what God says, as he's the one you'll be judged by on the last day. What does the gospel require of you in order to be saved? First, it requires that you hear his word. Romans 10 verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hearing God's message and instructions necessarily comes before an individual can believe and obey them. Look at Acts chapter 18 verse 8, for instance. You need to hear the basic truths that we've been establishing about what God has done for you so that you can be saved from your sins, and you need to hear about your responsibilities for salvation. Second, God requires you to believe. Faith or belief in God is in Christ is absolutely essential for salvation. Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The Bible consistently points to the essential nature of faith. Look at passages like John 3 and verse 16 and Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. For instance, in John chapter 8 and verse 24, Jesus said, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. However, the Bible also teaches that faith without works of obedience will not save us. Go and read James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Third, God requires you to repent of your sins. Jesus said in Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Repentance involves a change in mindset regarding past sin, that is, to view sin with abhorrence and to, de to determine to live differently in the future. Repentance is commanded often in the Scriptures, like in Acts 2, verse 38 and Acts 3, verse 19. You simply cannot die with Christ unless you put the old man of sin to death through repentance and turning to Jesus Christ for a new way of living, as you can see in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Fourth, you must confess Christ. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The confession that is commanded in this passage is not a confession of your sins but it is the confession of the Lord Jesus with your mouth. A good example of this confession is found over in Acts chapter 8 and in verse 37, when the man of Ethiopia, just prior to being baptized, said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Fifth, God requires that you be immersed in water that is to be baptized. In Mark 16 and verse 16, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Baptism is necessary for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2, verse 38, Acts 22, and verse 16. Paul wrote in Galatians 3, verse 27, that you are baptized into Christ, that is, you, that baptism brings you into union with Jesus Christ. Peter wrote that baptism now saves us, just as water saved Noah and his family, 1 Peter 3, verses 20 and 21. Clearly, the Bible teaches that baptism is necessary for salvation. Baptism is the point at which an individual becomes a Christian and is forgiven of his or her sins. It is at the point at which the sinner is washed, justified, and sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 6, 
verses 9 through 11, Acts 18, verse 8, Acts 22, verse 16, and other passages. It is also important to understand that the Bible teaches the action involved in being baptized is immersion in water. It's not sprinkling or pouring, and it's not Holy Spirit baptism. In fact, baptism is described as being a burial in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, and Colossians 2 and verse 12. Therefore, that old man of sin we put to death is buried with Christ in baptism, and we are walk, raised to walk in newness of life. And six, God requires that you remain faithful. Whenever you hear God's word, believe, repent of your sins, confess Christ, and are immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, you become a Christian and are added to Christ's church, Acts 2, verse 41 and verse 47. However, this does not mean that you are once saved, always saved. Instead, the Bible teaches that you must be faithful to the Lord unto death in order to receive the crown of life, that is, the eternal reward in heaven, as you can see in Revelation 2 and verse 10. This will involve doing all the things God has commanded you to do as a Christian, like to teach the gospel to others, to do good to all as you have opportunity, to be transformed in your character, to live a holy life, etc. You must faithfully obey God throughout your earthly life because it is possible for you to sin so as to be lost, as you can see in Galatians 5, verse 4, and Hebrews 10, verses 26 through 39. The gospel's plan of salvation, as we've just discussed, is not difficult, and it can be obeyed by anyone who is willing. However, most so-called Christian churches, pastors, preachers, etc., have perverted this plan of salvation. Instead of teaching this God-given plan of salvation, most churches teach a so-called plan of salvation that involves things like faith only, the sinner's prayer, infant baptism, etc. Furthermore, most have have said that baptism is not necessary for salvation or that baptism can be accomplished through sprinkling or pouring instead of being accomplished exclusively by immersion. In addition, many have claimed that you are once that that once you are saved, you cannot sin so as to fall away from the grace of God and lose your salvation. Please do not listen to any of these false gospels as they will lead to your eternal condemnation. Remember Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, and 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So as we close this study, we see that the gospel of Jesus Christ is full of blessings that has been made available to the entire world. However, few will do what the gospel requires for salvation. Please carefully consider this wonderful opportunity you have been given to be saved from your sins and determined to give your life entirely to be obedient to God by obeying the gospel's message.